in chapter 3 of John, we had just heard uh, from Nicodemus who was asking, uh, who, who had come to Jesus by night, and he, he said to uh, uh, Jesus, he called him rabbi, gave him a nice respectful uh, greeting, and the scripture takes us right to what was on Nic Nicodemus' heart. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, truly one must be born again. And Nicodemus didn't understand that, that how could you be born again and, and, and to see the kingdom of God when you can't enter the mother's womb? And Jesus said, well, unless one is born of God, of water and spirit, one cannot uh, enter the kingdom of God. And this was something that Nicodemus just really didn't understand. And we have to remember that what what Jesus was telling Nicodemus was stuff that was in Old in Old Testament scripture that born of water and spirit was was what was mentioned in Ezekiel thirty six uh, that being that Jesus was trying to use things that Nicodemus should know as the teacher of Israel and in chapter nine, nine or excuse me verse nine Nicodemus says to him he says how can these things be and Jesus said are you not the teacher of Israel are you not the person that's supposed to know Old Testament prophecy or the Old Testament law? Are you not that guy that's supposed to be teaching all the people of Israel what it is you're supposed to teach them and you don't even know these simple things? These simple things being is how does one receive the kingdom of God? And Jesus told him, he said in verse 11, we'll pick it up there, in, in verse 11, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what you know and testify of what we've seen. And you do not accept our testimony. See, what Jesus was saying is we. The we he's talking about is, is the Trinity. We, the God the Father. God the, the Father who knows what righteousness is. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit who, who knew the heart of, of uh, knew the troubled heart that Nicodemus had. And God the Son, the man that was he was standing there that he was speaking truth into. That, that, that the whole Trinity, he, Jesus was saying that we, are the ones who have testified about these things. And that you don't have a clue of what you know. That the things that we know, what we know is about the salvation of man. Is that how does man come to salvation? This is the plan God's had for salvation since the beginning of time. Since the fall in the garden. This is the, this is the eternal plan of God. And these things have been laid out in scripture, in, 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 in prophecy and law. And you don't, you don't even understand them. He says, how could you possibly not understand those things? He says that, these things that we have seen, that, that, that God causes all things to come together for His glory. That the glory of God is, is demonstrated throughout the, the whole Testament laws and prophecies, and you can't see that stuff. He says that the, that the Father has sent the Son into the world to speak authority into what's going on, and that Nicodemus doesn't see Him as the, 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 the Son of God. He sees Him as a rabbi, as a teacher. He knows that He was sent from God, but he doesn't understand that he's the Messiah, that he's the one that is sent from God. But Jesus uses the law and the old time prophets to try to explain to Nicodemus what's going on. He's trying to speak on Nicodemus' level. And Nicodemus is just not uh, understanding those things. So Jesus says, if I told you these earthly things, if I tell you these things that are earthly, and you do not understand them, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? How will you understand the things of, of of, of heaven if you can't even understand what's here on earth. The, the, the problem that Nicodemus was having was that, see, Jesus, the, the, the wording that Jesus used in, back in verse 3 is, one shall be born again or re, uh, born anew, is a spiritual rebirth. And Nicodemus just couldn't understand it because here's Nicodemus coming in all his righteousness. He's a self-righteous man. He's a Pharisee. He's a, he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He, he's, he's righteous to the law. That he's this perfect man that, that Jesus sees as a hypocrite. Because he's not, he, he's, Jesus knows his heart. Jesus knows that he's not even able to even kind of even sort of fulfill what the righteousness is. So Jesus tells him, he says, that you can't possibly understand earthly things, heavenly things, if you don't even understand the earthly things that are before you that you're a teacher of, that you're the teacher of the law of. What Jesus is telling him now in, in, in verse 13 is, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended, the Son of Man. That, some, that, that Jesus, there's no other person that has, been, that has ascended into heaven, that has 
descended from heaven to earth that knows what's going on. That, that only the Son of Man, which is prophesied out throughout the whole Testament, the Old Testament, back in Daniel 7, uh, the Son of Man is prophesied as the Messiah. So that's how, how much Nicodemus should understand. That he should understand that even in the, in the book of Daniel, a, a, a prophet that, that every Hebrew of Hebrew, every Pharisee should understand that even in Daniel 7, the, the Son of Man, the Messiah, was prophesied then. And you don't understand that. And Jesus is calling himself the Son of Man. He's taken on that who he is. I am the Son of Man, he's saying. But the important thing that that we have to see here is that it it takes a heavenly authority to give new birth. It takes it takes God to give somebody new birth. That it, that Nicodemus is, is he's where he's at his is he's not what he's not understanding is what do I have to do? What do I have to do if 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 I can stand on the corner with my tassels lengthened and pray and and and, and wear a, a box on my forehead with all these kind of things inside and I'm and I'm doing all these rituals. What more must I do? And what's the answer? See, that's the problem that we have today in society is we don't know. Uh, so many people don't know that answer nowadays. What is it that I'm supposed to do to receive the kingdom of God? What is it I'm supposed to do to, to receive eternal life with the, with, with the Savior? What is it I need to do? And the answer is so clear and so plain, that, and it's such an easy thing, but it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Because one must first humble themselves and realize that there's nothing that they can do, nothing they can do to receive the kingdom of heaven. They can't, there's no nothing at all one can do except what? Accept, accept your, your, your nothing. You're, you're, you're a nobody. You're, you're, you're meaningless. That you have absolutely nothing to give to, to be a child of God. The only thing you can do is, is realize that and, and humble yourself and, and, and say, God, I, I, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I can't, I can't go through life and even understand what the meaning of life is on my own. I need you. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, that's inside of me that's going to bring me closer to you. The only thing that's going to do that is your love for me. Your desire for me. Your calling of me. You're telling me that you want me to be a child of God. And that's, that's, the, that's God drawing you into Him. That's God saying that you have a new birth in Him, that you have a spiritual reality that God is the creator of heaven and earth and that He's going to give you eternal life in Him. It's something that a heaven must do. Nicodemus can't understand that because Nicodemus is, is righteous. He thinks that he's getting to heaven. He thinks he's going to see the kingdom of God. And Jesus is right there telling him, you're not going to ha- it's not going to happen, dude. You're, there's nothing you can do. Now, what, a, what do you think Nicodemus is thinking? First off, Nicodemus doesn't even realize this is the Son of Man. This is Jesus Christ. This is the Messiah. This is the, the Christ, the prophesied one, who is going to come and, and, and reestablish the kingdom. Nicodemus doesn't even understand that because he can't see far enough past his, his nose to see who he's talking to. But what is... what? Jesus goes right back to Old Testament. He goes right back to Old Testament. And he says this scripture, that he quotes the scripture here that Scott read. I want you to understand what, what was going on. Jesus is coming in a day where the Israelites are rejecting God. Where the Israelites are having these, 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 uh, these ceremonies where they're buying their sacrifices. They're, in the, they're going to the temple and celebrating a Passover and paying to, to, for their access to God. That they're not, they're coming, and the spiritual leaders of that day have made such a business out of being a Christian, or excuse me, a business out of being a child of God, that there's no access to God. Because it's not, it's, it's, it's let me pay for my access. And Jesus is saying, you're, <laughs> you're, you're rejecting the manna. 
You're rejecting the water. You're, you're rejecting all that we've done for you out here in the wilderness. You're not even happy you're, you're out of bondage, out of slavery. You've, you're unhappy about everything I've done for you, and now you're complaining about the bread and water I'm giving you. So he sends fiery serpents to bite them. And when they were bitten, they would die. Now, I don't know how long it would take for them to die, but surely they, would, they were going to die from the, from the serpent's bite, the fiery serpent's bite. And they make intercession. They say, Moses, please intercede for us. Moses, please. Oh, you know, so it's, it's when we're in pain. When we see death at, at our doorstep, when we don't have any other hope, we, uh, we finally humble ourselves and have, please intercede for me. And see, what does God do? God says, okay, Moses, build this standard. Build this fiery, this replica of that fiery serpent. Make this statue and stand it up and raise it up so that everyone must look up to it. They must look up to this standard, this, this standard that, that, that has this fiery snake on it, and they're going to have to do what? They're going to have to believe. They're going to have to believe. They're going to have to believe in that standard is going to heal them. They're going to have to have by faith believe that that standard is going to heal them. And, and, and so what do they get to see? They get to see the first guy going up there and get healed. And the next guy healed, and the next guy healed, and so now they're all just staring at that standard. What was the standard that God was trying to bring them back to? You must humble yourself and realize that there's nothing you can do to take serpent's bite away from you, that the fiery serpent that just bit you, there's nothing you can do to take it away except by faith. Look at that bronze serpent and be healed. So Jesus uses that event and says this. He says in verse 14, if you have a Bible with you and you have a verse 14 and 15 that you want to highlight, you, you should highlight that because that's some of the most important verses you'll see in your Bible in John. It says, just, it says, as Moses lifted the serpent up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's saying that, that the, he's, what is he telling you there? He's saying that the Son of Man will be lifted up. He's, he's prophesying. He's telling Nicodemus that he's going to be that sacrifice. That he's going to be lifted up. He's telling Nicodemus he's going to be lifted up on a stand. And why? He says in verse 15, so that whoever, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. What do they need to believe? What is it that they need to believe? What is it you believe? What is it that that today you believe in? What is it that you believe in today that's saying, yes, Jesus, yes, Lord? That you, that you believe in for your salvation? What is it that you believe in today that's saying, you are my standard? By faith I look upon you and believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. That there's nothing more I can do other than to believe in you, to have faith in that. See, that's such a simple message. But how hard is it for us to humble ourselves in such a way that we can go on bended knee and say, Yes, Lord. There's no other way but you. See, we'll hear how Jesus says, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but through me the world may be saved. Now what world is he talking about? Is he talking about everybody? No. He's talking about whomever. By faith will trust in Him as their Lord, as their Savior. That He's the Son of God. Then what does the Scripture say? What does it say in Romans 10, 9, 10? It says, if you, believe, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll, you'll be saved. You know, the, 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 the problem that we have with, with salvation is, are we sure we have it? I'm sure of mine. I'm, I'm so sure of my salvation because I believe, I know that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. I know that. I went most of my life not knowing. I went most of my life thinking it was just a fairy tale. And I used to wake up at nighttime screaming and yelling and cussing God, getting mad at God. God, why does people have to die? God, why do people die? Why do... Why? Why, why, why? And I'd ask that question over and over and over again. 
and I was so angry all the time. And the day, the time, the very night, the very day that I received salvation, from that day to today, I don't concern myself with that because I know what that answer is. But you know something? Believing in your heart is difficult. Because there's a lot to that verse there. The first thing I want you to realize is that Jesus is raised up on a standard. What's the standard? The standard is the cross. Jesus said all the time, pick up your cross and follow me. That we had to go and we have to bear that cross and follow him. What does it mean to bear a cross? I mean, it takes, he takes away the sins on that cross. That everything that man has ever done, everything that you have done, are doing, or will do in the future, everything has been forgiven. Isn't that amazing? That that very Savior knows you before time. And He knows what knucklehead things you're going to do. Trust me, He knows the knucklehead things I do. And he says to you, he, he says, return to me. When you, when you sin and you go off in a direction that you, don't, you know is not the right direction, he just says to you, return to me. Well, returning to him sometimes is difficult because we have to do what? We have to humble ourselves and admit our shame. We have to admit our guilt. That was what Adam's problem was in the garden, wasn't it? Adam, where are you? Where are you? God knew where Adam was at. He knew exactly where he was at. Adam, where are you? I'd heard the sound of you in the garden and I hid myself because I was ashamed. Because I was naked. My sin was exposed. I was ashamed. That's such an amazing thought. That, that is God calling you today? Is, is, is He calling your name and saying, where are you? Because he knows where you're at. But what's he really saying to you? He's saying, I know where you're at. You know where you're at. Come return to me. I love this. I, I love that, the, the, the Second Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth. So that he may strongly support those whose hearts are turned towards him. You know, the analogy that Jesus gave with the serpent being lifted up in the wilderness is not one that I know I will take lightly. I know that I look at it and go, what a Savior. What an awesome God. To show how, how easily one can, can receive the, the, the healing from the bite of the serpent. How, how many times have you ever looked at Old Testament and seen New Testament in it? It used to be a hard thing for me to do. I used to look at Old Testament and 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 just read through it, and then I'd read something in Old Testament. I go, "Aha! I read something like that." And I'd go back to the Old Testament. I'd read it, and it would just it would just make things just open up so so much for me. And I'd just go, "Wow!" Something that was written twenty five hundred years ago. 3,500 years ago, and something that was written 2,000 years ago, they match. And then I got that, that pessimistic thought process. Well, maybe the dude was writing it because of what it said over here. And I realized one day that it was. It was God's Word. That, that the water... The water that I'm going to be reborn with, I'm going to be spiritually cleansed with, that I'm going to be reborn of water and spirit, that this water, this Word, is the water that we cleanse ourselves with. It says in, in Ephesians 5, I talked about it last week, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, holding them holy and blameless without spot or blemish, washing them with the water of the Word. That if I, if I keep myself in the Word and I see the standard that God wants me to have and I try to go that in that light, that, I, that standard, that path 
that God has me in, then I'll be fine. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every sin and thing and encumbrance that, 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 that takes a hold of us. The things that encumber us, the things that weigh us down. Let us take and push them aside. And then do what? That we're fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So who? For the joy that sat before him, for the joy that was before him, despised the cross and endured the shame, that he was crucified for that reason, that we should fix our eyes on that. If I'm to fix my eyes on the cross, and that cross is my standard, I understand why Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I understand why Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. I understand all the ways Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. I understand what the meaning of the cross is. Every Christian church in the world is united around the cross. That's the one standard that every Christian church in the world is united around. Do they have little different things over here? I don't know what I do. Roman soldier in there. Pretty cool. I don't know. I know that, that the standard that God left us to do was the cross. And what does that cross mean to you? What are you doing today? What are you doing in your life today for the glory of God, for, the God, for God's kingdom? What are you doing in your life today to say that that standard that Jesus Christ bore for you is what you put your faith, hope, and trust in? That's a hard question to ask. Because i got to realize that, that all my deeds of righteousness are but filthy rags. Amen? God calls us by faith. It says in verse 15, whoever believes. That's the hardest thing you're going to have is faith. In Him. Whoever has faith believes in in Christ, will in Christ have eternal life. Amen? I know that sometimes we have messages that I get passionate about. I get passionate about the, the, the business of church. I, if you, church is never going to be a business here as long as I'm around. I promise you. We're never going to be a business. But I, God, over the last few weeks, has really been beating the snot out of me about unity. About how do, how do we be a unified body? How do we create a unity among us? Among sinners? Among people who really just have, really trying to get to the next day? What a I don't want to be that. I don't want to just go one day to the next. I don't want to go just through every day focused on the love of Christ. If 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 we're a if we're a body of if we're disciples of Christ, if we're a body of believers, if we're a people that are unified as the children of God. What is it that we can do to love our neighbor? What is it we can do to make just the outside of this place here just a, a little more brighter to look at? Or, or, or the, the space around your desk at work, just a, a little bit brighter place to be right? Or, or driving down the road, just to, the, that guy, that gal that's just a little bit more pleasant to drive next to. It's just a I just see God saying to us, to us, to unify, be together. To quit dividing amongst the, the little things of this world. They're not important. But the only thing that's important is what? Jesus Christ and Him. I don't know. I know that, that Jesus calls us to come to the standard. And that's my goal. My goal every day when I wake up in the morning is to come to the standard, and when I go to sleep at night, making sure that God did I was I was I pleasing. Did I do the things for your glory today? 
Sometimes I say, nope, sure didn't. But I hope every day I can do that more better. That word more better. Let me pray for you. Father God, your wisdom, your ways, your words, they're just they're just a blessing that we could never really fully understand until we just draw as close to you as we can. Your word says draw close, draw near to you, and you'll draw near to us. Father, accept us just constantly drawing near to you so that we can be better at representing you as our Father, as our God, as our Lord. Father, we thank you for this cross. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for all the things that you do in our lives, Father. Let us be more pleasing in our path of you. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All I know is I'm not